Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cogent Strategic Wealth's webinar, What Should Investors Do Now? In light of high inflation, market volatility, and possible recession, we want to bring to you some information that you can use, you can digest, and actually make it actionable for you. Hi, I'm Michael Evans. I'm the founder and fiduciary wealth manager at Cogent Strategic Wealth. Today, we will explore what investors can do to better position themselves for these challenging circumstances that we find ourselves in today. But at the end of the webinar, I really hope that you feel better educated, that as an investor, you understand a little bit more about the situation we find ourselves in, and then also you feel empowered to take the prudent next steps for you, both personally and maybe professionally, to ensure that you survive and thrive through the present chaos. At the end of this webinar, we really hope you have this better understanding, and we're going to share some things with you, some ideas, some other things that you can take action, but we'll also have some resources that we'll make available. So stick around to the end, and you'll hear about some special offers that we're going to have for you. So today, I'd just like to say how excited I am to have Kevin Grogan joining us. Hello, Kevin. Good to be with you, Michael. Great, Kevin. It's wonderful to see you. Kevin Grogan is not only a, a long-term friend of mine, but he's also the Managing Director of Investment Strategy for Buckingham Wealth Partners. Cogent is affiliated with them. While we're a boutique firm, we also appreciate the large organization that we're a part of that helps us serve our high-achieving, successful professionals so much better. Um, Kevin works with a group uh, that's called the Investment Policy Committee, which really helps us better be able to position our clients for great success in their investing. Uh, Kevin does so much. One of the things he does is read, analyze, and work on the latest research for investments in finance. And I'm so glad he does that. Even though I love to read it, I'm just happy Kevin is the one that does this. Um, Kevin's able to draw practical applications, though, that we can use with our clients to improve the structure of their portfolios and achieve their goals. And if you agree with me, that would also improve their life in some ways and the others around them. Uh, Kevin's a member of, as I mentioned before, the firm's investment policy committee, and he really leads their investment strategy, portfolio management, and fixed income teams. And that's really beneficial to us. But one of the things I think Kevin is really good for me is he's an interpreter. He takes this evidence-based research that we use to implement our financial portfolios, mine, the entire Cogent teams, and all our clients. And Kevin helps us digest what's important, apply what needs to be applied, and be really able to reassess and educate ourselves on what comes out and what's new in light of circumstances and also solutions as investors. So today, I'm just really excited to get into a dialogue with Kevin. Um, Kevin's written three books, fantastic books, all of them. And hint, no spoiler alert here, we're going to offer these books to you at the end. One of them is a book that I believe Kevin and Larry wrote back in 2010 um, that I wrote, I read right when it came out. It's called uh, The Only Guide You'll Need to the Right Financial Plan. He also has an interesting book that takes a little different look at financial planning and portfolio construction called Reducing the Risk of Black Swans. I think it's really interesting how Kevin helps apply the science to capture returns with less volatility. I mean, who doesn't want to get higher returns with less risk? I mean, that's the, the holy grail of investing. And then, of course, his most recent book, which I really, really like with Larry Swedro, is Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. Uh, Wall Street Journal threw out a uh, great accolade to him and named it the best retirement book in 2019. So, Kevin, cheers to you. Fantastic that you've brought all this information to consumers and helped educate them, both through working with Buckingham Strategic Wealth and us on the Buckingham Strategic Partner side. Cheers. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Michael, and I've, of course, enjoyed getting to know you over the past 10 plus years and, and some of your clients as well. So it's been a, a great relationship over the years. You know, Kevin, I appreciate that so much. Kevin, one of the things that we are going to delve into is what to do about inflation and higher rates and other things. But just tell me, what, what draws you into this? What, what makes you want to write these great books and what makes you want to educate consumers like you do? Sure. So I've always had an interest in, in markets. So I think that's really where it where it starts, going all the way back to when I was you know pretty, pretty young, you know, in, in, into my teenage years. Always enjoyed paying attention 
to what was happening in, in markets. But one of the things that attracted me to, to Buckingham in, in the first place, and really the, the sort of the broader advice business is just getting to have uh, deep relationships with clients and, and getting them to be able to achieve their goals over, over a long horizon. So one of the things I think about is that for the, for the most part, uh, a lot of our clients were not uh, overnight successes in terms of in terms of getting wealth overnight. It was through a long, arduous process of being really good at whatever their craft is, whether that's a lawyer, dentist, doctor, business owner, whatever it is. It took a lot of time and a lot of hard work in order for them to accumulate their wealth, and then they've come to us, either either you, Michael, or or to, to Buckingham more broadly, to to trust us to to take it from there to to invest their assets in a prudent way to help them achieve their goals, knowing that they did the right things on the front end in terms of generating the wealth, setting aside their assets, being good stewards up to that point, but now trusting us on the go forward to, to do what's right to help them achieve their goals. Oh, Kevin, that's so admirable. And thank you so much for assisting my clients and my own personal family. I really appreciate the depth and the time that you've gone in to so many things with me to make sure that we look at what the trade-offs are, understand what the benefits could be, and make and you know educate consumers, including myself and my family, on how to make prudent decisions to go forward in light of the information we have. So, Kevin, cheers to you. How fantastic is that? Thank you. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot about is market declines. Um, I think investor psychology is really, really an interesting field, something that we talk about often in our study groups and other things. But we look at the decline that we're in today. And for whatever reason, the multitude of things that are out there, Kev, how do you think this decline differs from previous mar market declines that investors maybe uh, have gone through in the past? Sure. So as I think about it, I think there are some, some differences and there are some similarities. So starting with the, the differences, and as I think about the last three big, bigger declines that we've seen would be sort of the, the tech bubble bursting all the way through sort of 9-11. That's, that's sort of one big crisis we had. We had the uh, financial crisis in 07, 08. And then we had uh, the COVID economic decline that happened in sort of February, March, April. 2020. And after all of those events, the Federal Reserve stepped in to help markets, help the economy, but, but by extension, help markets by cutting rates in all three instances. And then after the, the financial crisis, as well as the COVID crisis, do a good bit of additional stimulus on top of, uh, on top of just uh, cutting rates in the form of quantitative easing. What's different about this market pullback, and I think at this point, it is a pretty major pullback in the, in the market so far this year. U.S. stocks off uh, north of 20% so far this year. That's a, that's a pretty big decline in the market. Is the difference this time is that the Federal Reserve isn't helping. In fact, it's going the other direction with the Federal Reserve raising rates because inflation has, has been very, very high over the past 12 to 18 months. So the Federal Reserve isn't coming to the market's rescue. This time, the Federal Reserve is what is is part of what's cooling off financial markets so far this year. So that's I think the big difference. I think though one similarity with with prior declines is that you never know when things will, will come back or when the worst of it will be over. As you think about uh, say just the most recent crisis we had, the COVID one, the market pulled back February, March, uh, April of 2020 but started coming back well before it felt safe to get back in, well before shots started going into arms from a vaccine perspective. So you never really know when these things will turn around. And by the time it feels safe, the market will have already come back. And so that's, I think, one similarity across each of those different declines is that you never know when it's going to be safe to get back in. Kevin, that's a great perspective. And framing it in light of what we saw before in the Fed, being able to step in and to be able to add a hand. Um, I really appreciate that perspective because it is different. I mean, we don't often see fixed income going in the same direction as 
uh, uh, as an equity product. So we really appreciate that, Kevin. So let's talk about that. Uh, let, let, let's move into that question. So how should an investor think about the safe and secure portion of their portfolio, which you and I both know is fixed income, uh, if they're choosing appropriately for what they hold? And uh, with rates moving up, how, how should we think about fixed income in a portfolio? Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right that it's been a, a long time since we've seen both stocks and bonds have negative returns at the, at the same time. Um, and it's been a, a historically bad period for, for fixed income so far this year. So if you look at like the, the Bloomberg aggregate bond index, it used to be the Barclays before that was the Lehman <laughs> aggregate bond index. The first quarter of 2022 was the worst quarter that's had since 1981. So a, a really long time since we've seen bonds go through such a difficult stretch. And, and again, as you said, making matters worse, that stocks are down at the same, the same time, which we aren't really used to in the period since the financial crisis. We've seen bonds and stocks move in opposite directions for the most part over the past 14 years. Now, I'd say in terms of how investors should be thinking about all of this, I think, uh, number one, that in terms of the planning that we do for clients, meaning the capital market assumptions that we input into, into financial plans that contemplate events like this. So it isn't unheard of that you can see stocks and bonds go down at the same time. So that is accounted for within the planning that, uh, that we all do for clients. So I think that's the first thing is that while yes, it's never fun to go through, it, it is accounted for in, in the plan. Um, but then, but then secondly, I think with respect to the negative returns on fixed income, while it is painful in the short run, I would say over the long run, it's actually good news for most investors, because if you have a longer horizon, if we are going to see higher expected returns on fixed income, on balance, that's a good thing for, for retirees, that you can actually get a return from the safe portion of your portfolio that you wouldn't have been able to get before. Now, again, it's not fun in the here and now, but as you reinvest your fixed income over the long run, it's it's actually a better thing for end investors. Yeah, I agree. I think we've been punishing save, savers, right, on people that had cash or had uh, large holdings in fixed income for quite some time. And it would be like nice for this to normalize a little bit, I believe. Um, well, Kevin, that's very interesting about the fixed income and uh, the allocation. I also like you pointing out about the financial plan. One of the things I find particularly gratifying about being a financial advisor is to sit down and to distill just where clients are at when they come to us, where their family's at. So what their particular circumstances are, what they have and where they have it, and also what their goals are. And then to build a financial plan, a sophisticated, comprehensive financial plan, not one that just says, if I get X return over the years, I'm going to have so much. And if I take 4% out later, that's wonderful, but that's not very prudent way to look ahead. And as you say, financial planning is wonderful, especially when it has a comprehensive Monte Carlo feature that looks ahead and does anticipate even hard times such as this with a uh, declining different portions of your of your portfolio. So thanks for pointing that out. Some I really like to do. I look at my own plan and all of our clients quite often, and it's really important, very important. So the reason why the interest rates are being backed up by the Federal Reserve, it seems as if the current media is saying that the Fed is a little behind the curve. They kept rates lower, longer than they maybe should have. And now that inflation has reared up, it's appeared within our lives that the Fed might be a little behind. So thus, they're going at a, cl a faster clip to normalize rates, if not even uh, you know, start to tighten. But when you think about investment portfolios and what clients have, Kevin, what type of investments would help protect investors from high inflation if it was something that they were prone to be susceptible or, or vulnerable to? Sure thing. I think the, the main investment that comes immediately to mind are an investment called TIPS or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So these are bonds that are issued by the U.S. Treasury that are explicitly linked to inflation. So you get whatever the yield is quoted on that bond and then whatever inflation winds up being. And so they, particularly shorter term tips, are really the best hedge that's out there for inflation. Now, of course, the drawback to, to tips is that they're relatively low expected return, although at least right now, 
they are earning a po- what's called a positive real yield. So you're earning a small return that's in the in the positive territory plus whatever inflation winds up being, which you know is is a good solution. Although you again you don't want it for a huge fraction of your portfolio because it is going to be lower expected return. Um, but again, it will do well in periods of, of high unexpected unexpectedly high inflation. Same would be true of commodities. So we've seen both tips and commodities in particular do really, really well so far this year. And that's because inflation was much, much higher than the market expected coming into this year. And so commodities historically have had that property that when inflation is unexpectedly high, they will tend to do tend to do really well. And so again, we don't generally recommend huge allocations to commodities because they are very, very volatile. So unlike, unlike short-term tips, Commodities will move around a lot and they can go through long periods where they deliver negative returns as they did for most of the 2010s up until we started to see inflation pick back up here in the early 2020s. And so you you do want to sort of moderate the size of the allocation, but that could be something to consider if you are particularly concerned with inflation. And then the third thing that often comes up in terms of people asking about potential inflation protection would be equities. And so Equities aren't a great hedge against inflation over the short term, because as we saw this year, we've seen inflation run very hot, and yet yet equities have had negative returns. But over the very, very long term, stocks have tended to outpace inflation, not necessarily because they're directly linked with inflation, just that they deliver a high enough of a risk premium to be higher than what inflation has wound up being historically. So those are sort of the three things that you can think about are over the long term and allocation to stocks can be helpful, a small allocation to commodities, and then investing a portion of your fixed income into tips would be the three things to consider during periods of of high inflation. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Thanks for that, Kevin. You know, one of the things I do uh, every birthday that I celebrate is I look back and I see uh, when I was born, what inflation has done since then. And it's been about 3.9% for me in my life since I was born. So uh, what that equates to for $1 when I was born, it, it has the, you, you need to have $9 to have about the same purchasing power. But if you look at the S&P 500, just to use a general well-known benchmark for that, um, since 1965, it's up a little over 10%. So to think about that in terms of protecting wealth over a long period of time, um, it, it's actually very interesting. And of course, small and value are up a higher proportion during that period also. So um, while inflation can be uncomfortable, one of the hedges, as you said, is a phenomenal, um, uh, well diverse, globally diversified uh, portfolio that leans towards small and value over a long period of time. It can you know, produce a multiple uh, over what you get. So Kevin, when you think about fixed income in a portfolio, it has its its purpose, right? It's a ballast. It's what allows us to take the risk. Are there any other things out there? Um, I've read your book about reducing the risk of uh, black swans that you wrote. Um, are there other products out there besides equities and fixed income that an investor may want to consider including in their portfolio? There are. So the, the other sort of class of investments that we would uh, think about would be alternative assets. And there's that's obviously a huge umbrella uh, that could capture lots of different things. I think it's fair to say that uh, we're still quite skeptical of the vast majority of alternative investment strategies that are out there. But we do think there are some that can make sense to add to a portfolio that should be expected to outperform safe fixed income, but while still having very low correlation with equities. And I wouldn't gloss over that second piece because lots of times you can see uh, alternative investment strategies that are out there that that appear to have great returns, but then when the stock market's down, they're down uh, right along with it. And that's not really what you want. If if you're investing in an alternative asset, you're you're accepting that generally higher fees, generally uh, less liquidity than what you can get in traditional markets. You want that portion of the portfolio to really be there from a diversification perspective when, when stocks are down. So we recommend a menu of different alternative assets. The, the heaviest allocations tend to be more towards private credit type of strategies. Uh, and again, these strategies are more complex. They are more expensive and they do have less liquidity. So you don't want to go into these things lightly, but we think they can add value to the portfolio and they, they have done 
well on a relative basis so far this year when stocks and traditional bonds have been down. So, Kevin, thanks. I think what you're saying is uh, to diversify your sources of return in a portfolio, it's imperative to do that, but you also have to be very particular about how you implement. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And I, I think, I, again, I think there's lots of things that fall in, under the umbrella of alternatives. And you just need to be careful and to make sure that what you're investing in isn't just equity exposure in an expensive disguise. That's what you really need to watch out for. I can appreciate that. One thing I'm kind of dis- not kind of very disappointed in our community of people that hold themselves out as financial advisors, many of them are merely pushing products, things such as hedge funds, uh, index annuities, uh, sometimes some other types of opportunities that uh, insurance and other things that all they want to do is sell you a product, not deliver a solution for your lifetime. So I think the marketing arm of our uh, of the product developers and all sometimes cross the line in that they're better incented to sell the product than you should be to buy it. And thank you, Kevin, you've been one of the people that have been great to educate me and my clients on what's appropriate and what's not so we can make as consumers really good decisions for ourselves that have long-term tangible effects for us. And and thank you for that. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right with respect to uh, to the, the, the difference between offering products and offering service and advice. And I, there is a, a clear distinction between the advisors who are pushing product versus the ones that don't. And I think you know, being on the fiduciary side of the fence, as, as you and I are, makes it very easy to sleep at night with what we do for a living on a, on a day in, day out basis. Just uh, for, for frame of reference, in Buckingham, Cogent, uh, neither of us get any uh, revenue from the funds or the products that we recommend in client accounts. Our only source of revenue is the, the fee that we charge our clients, which we feel great about in terms of the value that we provide uh, and the fact that it's it's free of most conflicts. And the one thing I'll even take it further than that, Kevin, is both you and I own many of the same portfolios as our clients do, just set up correctly for our own iterations of our circumstances and everything. But we actually invest in the same way that we advise our clients, own the same products. And I think that's also a differentiator. So one, we're not compensated inappropriately for selling or pushing certain products, but we're also sitting on the same side of the table. And so when times like this, when markets go down, when uh, things do get uncomfortable due to pandemics or other uh, uh, extraordinary events, you and I feel the same pain our clients do, but we also have the the beauty and and ever of the education and the research, and we're able to articulate to to others so that they too can survive and thrive. And that's one of the things, uh, um, you know, that I don't just have to have empathy; I can also have sympathy for them because my account's down also, and uh, I appreciate that. But uh, in order to be a long term investor and get the goodness that capitalism delivers through financial markets, I do believe it's important that we have a plan so that we can monitor ourselves and not do something that's inappropriate for you in the worst time so that you don't have the ability to recover later on. I I just find it like my life's mission to help people better understand the science and what has happened in the past and what we could expect going forward. And I appreciate you, Kev, uh, helping me do that for others. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would just sort of co-sign what you, what you said there in terms of we don't recommend anything in client portfolios that we're not owning ourselves. If you looked at, as an example, Buckingham's 401k plan, it's invested in the exact same types of funds that we're recommending for our clients and same, same with the personal portfolio as well. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, appreciate that. So, Kev, well, one of the things you have mentioned is the Fed is moving and they're moving because of interest rates. Um, when we think about inflation, and I'm not going to ask you to have a crystal ball. You've told me a couple of times before that yours is just as cloudy as everybody else's. But what do you? How do you look at inflation, and how do you view it within a uh, financial plan and a portfolio? And what do you see coming down the pipeline in some way for uh, investors? And so, as you said, we we are not big on on predictions. But if you looked at what the market is forecasting for inflation. Uh, which again, the market could be wrong. The market was wrong a year ago, thinking that that uh, inflation would have moderated by now. And the latest inflation print we saw was from from May, uh, saw uh, inflation still at north of eight eight and a half percent. I think it was at eight point six percent. But if you look at what the market's forecasting for, say, the next five, ten years, it's looking at inflation in the mid twos, which is still 
north of, of the Fed's long run target, but I think we could all live with inflation of 2.4, 2.8% somewhere in, in that range, just not at this crazy high, you know, five to 8% level. And of course, it's, it's very, very difficult to predict where, where things will go from here. But if you, if you, you sort of read most sort of macroeconomic forecasts that are out there, most people seem to think that inflation either peaked with that, that May report or is likely to have peaked in terms of a year over year number with the June or July report. So I, I realize I'm, I'm hedging bets a little bit here, but basically saying that you know, we may continue to see inflation in the eights for the next two or three months and on a year over year basis, but then should start to come down after that, uh, likely due to a combination of factors, you know, partially the, the Federal Reserve uh, tamping down demand by, by raising rates, but we've also started to see uh, some energy prices start to come down a bit over the past few months. And so it's possible that we, we've been through the worst of it, although again, the market was thinking that you know, three or four months ago and when that turned out to not be true. So you, you never really know how these things will, will turn out, but there are some signs that things are improving from, from an inflation point of view. But in terms of the investor's perspective, you can't really control what inflation is going to be. The best you can do is come up with a portfolio that's, that, uh, that tries to protect against inflation by, by having things like tips or commodities that are in the portfolio already for when inflation does rear its ugly head and then you're, you're protected against it. So Kevin, when you talk about that as a consumer, as, a, as an investor, um, tell me what, what, what moves do you think they can make to start to get their wrap their arms around where they're at and what they should be doing proactively here, seeing higher inflation is what we're living with, possibility of a recession is coming. We don't, we don't know, and maybe we're already in it, we're not sure. But um, just all these different things, this chaos that we see in front of us, what should investors and people do on a personal finance perspective uh, during this period? Yeah, so I think there's a couple areas where our, our advice is likely has changed or is about to change based on the inflation that we've seen and the rising interest rates that we've seen. So for the last 10 or 12 years, when an investor would, would come to me and say, hey, I've got this extra money to either invest or pay off my mortgage, which should I do? And the most, for the most part, our advice has been to go ahead and pay off the mortgage. Because if your mortgage is at, even if it's at a low level at three or 4%, if all you can earn on fixed income is zero or less than 1%, then a lot of times it makes sense to just go ahead and, and pay off the mortgage. Now we're kind of getting to a tipping point where you can earn three, 4% on fixed income and maybe your mortgage is only at 3%. In that case, it gets to be more of a difficult call as to whether or not to pay off the mortgage or invest. So that's one, one area where this rising rate, high inflation might change some of our advice. The second area that I would think about is uh, not so much general inflation, but specifically on home price appreciation is to take another look at your homeowner's insurance. So if you, you purchase your home for half a million or a million dollars, depending upon what your, your local market is looking like, if, even if you just bought it five, seven years ago, that, that home price could have doubled or more in, in that stretch of time. Again, depending upon your markets, you want to make sure that you still are covered enough from a homeowner's insurance perspective, if there is some disaster that befalls your home, that you're insured enough to rebuild and replace uh, that, that home. And so you need to just check on that and make sure that, that you have enough insurance, uh, enough, enough homeowner's insurance to protect the, the now current value of your, home, of your home, or more specifically, whatever it would cost to replace your home. Now, we've seen inflation in, in labor costs, we've seen inflation in a lot of the, the labor materials that go into building a home. So it's, it's worthwhile to double check to make sure you, you still have enough homeowner's insurance to cover your home. And of course, you, know, you can work with, with Michael or Kelly on that. Oh, Kevin, that's fantastic. I love both of your points. One, it's almost always a decision of the trade-offs when you have money. Where, where should you apply it and what is best for your situation? And I really appreciate that. I've, I've written extensively on in defense of a home mortgage 
and we have that to share with anybody on here, just send us an email uh, after you uh, watch this. Be happy to show you the trade-offs and all about why having some leverage appropriate amount on your house could actually help your financial plan where you're going. Um, and then the second thing about reviewing the other parts of your financial life. We've mostly focused on the portfolio today. There is so much more in a comprehensive wealth management plan than just the investments. There are, there's insurance products, there's tax efficiency, there's the uh, risk management as we talked about, but many of them, including disability and uh, life insurance and many other things. And, and also appropriately insuring your home, as you said, Kevin, very important. So thanks. And we're big, big fans of doing a review on a schedule. We do that for all our clients at Cogent. We would um, compel everybody on this webinar to make sure that they also look at those things for themselves. Uh, they need review. There's tax law changes. There's often uh, situational changes in your lives. All of those things should come together and should be reviewed. So thanks, Kev. Appreciate it. Uh, Kevin, I've written recently on a piece of the 20 steps to take now to prepare for a recession. I'm not making a prediction that we are in or going to enter a recession, but historically when the Federal Reserve has raised rates, it sometimes pretends to a slowdown in the economy. Um, some of the things that I love to talk about is building up your uh, emergency rainy day fund, you know, to make sure you can survive and thrive through anything. Um, I would uh, establish or even increase your retirement plan contributions that you had. Uh, like you said, review your um, review your uh, insurance products for appropriate levels, but also your estate plans. It's a great time to do that now. Uh, we just came out of COVID. We saw how devastating things can be looking at that. What about, Kevin, would you tell us a little bit about um, uh, portfolios, though, and, and, and we'll share the 20 steps if anybody wants it uh, when you reach out afterwards. But would you talk a little bit about the things we can do proactively when markets pull back, such as rebalancing or tax loss harvesting in a portfolio? Yeah, ha happy to talk about both of those. And just a, a reminder, too, that as you think about what the stock market has done already, is that is another sort of thing that might might forecast a, a recession coming in the economy because the, the market is always forward looking. So the fact that the market's already down 20% is basically telling you that the market is afraid that we'll, we'll see some sort of economic pullback. And so in terms of what you can do in your portfolio when, when the market's down, I think you hit on a couple of them. So one would be consider rebalancing. Now I'd say one interesting or unfortunate aspect of the current environment is you've got both stocks and bonds down at the same time. And so you, what, what you're doing when you rebalance is you're, you're selling what has done relatively well and buying what, is, what has performed relatively poorly. Right now, you've got an environment where both, uh, tr both sets of traditional assets are, are down. So there may not be an opportunity to rebalance at this point in time, but that's something we, we monitor for on a, on a regular basis. So that is something that we're on top of. If it makes sense to rebalance, we'll, we'll reach out. And then the second thing would be tax loss harvesting, which is where you essentially sell an asset that is, has declined in value. You realize that loss, and then you buy another asset that, that is similar but not identical to the original asset and, and invest in that for a period of time. So you still have the same exposure. Economically, you're basically in the same spot, but you've now realized that loss, which you can use to offset income to some degree each year. But, but for the most part, also used to offset future capital gains that you may have in your portfolio. So it helps, helps you in the future to offset future taxes. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Kevin. And, uh, you know, uh, as working with a fee-only fiduciary advisor, they should be taking those steps automatically. I believe that should be written into your investment policy statement that you have for managing your assets and make sure it's done appropriately, not just on a calendar, not just every November or every May. I think it should be done opportunistically throughout the year as markets change, because those things can add some value to the uh, lessen the amount of taxes that you pay or keep you in your seat with the appropriate amount of risk with the volatility in the market. So appreciate that. Kevin, anything else that you have on your mind before I wrap this up today? I really enjoyed it so far, but Anything else you've been thinking about lately? Yeah, I've enjoyed the time. The main things I, I leave you with are just always remember what your, your time horizon is. So even though 2022 has been really rough from a, a market's perspective, again, seeing stocks and bonds both down at the same time, 
presumably you weren't planning to spend your entire portfolio in, in 2022. Most likely you were planning to, to keep that portfolio for the next 5, 10, 20, maybe longer uh, years in your, in your life. And over the long run, what we've seen is that the, the stock market always recovers eventually, just like we will eventually have a recession. Don't know whether it'll be this year, next year, or even, even beyond that. You know that eventually we'll have a recession and you know that eventually the stock market will, will recover. Uh, so the, the best advice we can give is to A, stick to your plan, uh, but B, as we, as we talked about earlier, focus on having uh, diversified sources of return. So meaning not just stocks, not just U.S. stocks, uh, include international stocks, not just international, not just large cap stocks, also include uh, small cap stocks. And, and if, you know, if you're so inclined, not just stocks and bonds, but also incorporate an allocation to alternatives. And these can all help, help insulate you against the, the market declines that we've seen this year and, and potentially in, in future years. But no matter the strategy that you're in, it can always go through a period where it, it, it performs in a disappointing way. But the, the key to a successful long run strategy is to stick with it because everything eventually recovers. Oh, fantastic. That's, that's really prudent advice and very, very, very good long term perspective. I appreciate that so much. Well, Kevin, I just wanted to say thank you and all. And I'm going to wrap us up here with some actionable items that you can take as a high achieving, successful professional. You actually can do things appropriately now that you can control, as Kevin said, and ignore maybe some of the noise in the process. Not easy to do. And we, we, we understand that, but the things you can actually do are the important things that you should focus on. So uh, we hope that by watching this video, you have confidence to stay the course and keep investing in a way that's appropriate for your circumstances. And also, as Kevin said, focus on the long term, because at Cogent, we really work as a partner with our clients and we want to make sure this isn't just a set and forget. It's actually serving as a guide to, this, to you as a successful professional so that you know you have an expert. An expert not only on the markets and on other things, but also an expert on you so that we can help you get to where you want with the highest probability of success and having a partner over the long term that can be objectionable and really work well with you. So let's talk about some steps that you can take today. So the one I really, really like, and I do this with my own family. Uh, my wife sometimes requires a glass of wine while we do this, but uh, is review your current situation. I call it a family financial audit. I really like when people sit down in a family and they actually look through and see where the issues are, what you have, what you own, where your risk lies. Maybe look at your employment, everything from your income and spending levels to your banking and investment accounts, even your company retirement plans, mortgage debts, all of that. Take an inventory, see where you're at and really become knowledgeable and discuss it amongst yourselves. Uh, in reviewing your situation, I also think you should prepare yourself for any volatility to come. I'm not saying that we are going to go lower or going to go higher. I'm just saying to be a successful investor, you need to be able to survive and thrive through it. So if you're a business owner or a high-end professional that's in a cyclical business, I would say you want to be able to shore up your rainy day fund. So keep that as highly liquid, FDIC insured, keep an appropriate amount. I myself keep a year of spending in there. I, I have a business, two homes, and a lot of people counting on me. I want to make sure that I can survive and thrive no matter what happens. And I think you should take those same steps. Um, and so beef up your rainy day fund. And then also review your financial investment plan with the tips that Kevin has given us today. Look at the amount of risk you take, how you can diversify those sources of return, and just see if your assumptions are correct. Um, I always believe that high achieving successful professionals have a optimistic outlook. So I often think an objective second opinion is always important. So for you on the call here, to, you know, on this webinar, watching it or watching it in, in the future, I'd like to offer you our second opinion service. Our second opinion service uh, will look at what, where you're at and where you're going. It'll look at your resources that you have to bridge the two. And then we'll have a frank conversation about what is good, what's bad, and what can be improved. Promise you, if you're on the right track, we'll let you know. If you aren't and you need to make some adjustments, we'll help you with those ideas. So you really want to know, are you taking on too much investment risk? Are you suffering from too much or too little returns in your portfolio? Are you paying too much in fees? Or is even as Kevin and I talked about previously, 
Are the investments well aligned with you and your family's life goals? I think that's so important. So give us a call, reach out to us, cogentsw.com, or you can send an email to conversations at cogentsw.com. And we'd love to sit down, but I want you to be proactive and ready for what's to come. Not having a crystal ball, just taking the prudent steps that you can take. And remember, life is uncertain. Markets are even more precarious. This means building wealth has no shortcuts. It requires a really solid investment approach, a long-term perspective, as Kevin has mentioned multiple times, and also the discipline to stay the course. So instead of leaving your financial future to chance, you need to have a plan a short-term one to get you through the chaos and a longer-term one to accomplish all that's important to you and your family. Remember, others are counting on you and Cogent may be a portion of the solution to help you get to where you're going. So thank you very much. Remember, reach out to us if you'd like one of Kevin's books. We'd be more than happy to mail the uh, complete guide to a successful and uh, secure retirement. Honestly, this is pretty much a manual for what we do. If you're a busy professional and your time is not as uh, ample and open for you to do it, come talk to a fiduciary fee-only fi uh, financial advisor like us at Cogent and make sure that you get your house in order and that you position yourself for success. Give us a call, 312-382-8388 or email conversations at cogentsw.com. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. It's great to be with you, Michael. Great. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We really appreciate this Cogent conversation on how to best prepare yourself and your financial house to be able to survive and thrive through anything. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.